Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground, I'm your host, Ashley Hall. On this week's episode of Common Ground, we meet Steve Sievers, who develops paintings from simple lines and colors to bring together an eye-pleasing result. Plus, we meet the waitresses from Bemidji's historic Third Street Cafe, who talk about their days in the diner. Third Street Cafe had a motto, this is the place where friends meet. And back 50 years ago, there were not very many restaurants in town, so we were always very, very busy. My folks, Hans and Louise Marx, owned and ran Third Street Cafe for a number of years. My dad was a chef trained in Germany, and he met my mom at the Pfister Hotel in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Initially, they did not get along really well, <laughs> but later on they got together and got married. Hans and Louise Marx were absolutely wonderful people. They were so good to me. I'm Cleo Schwartz. I started at Third Street in 1949. And the thing I remember the most about it is it was a half a block long, so you had a long ways to carry your food up to the front of the restaurant. My name is Norma Lundin, and being I really like to eat, I remember some of the terrific food they had, and I learned a new language when I went there. Uh, we served graveyard stew, which was milk toast, and that was a takeoff for oyster stew because oysters were kind of expensive, but toast wasn't. Then we served corned beef hash with a poached egg right in the middle of it. I'd never heard of that before. And we had, every Sunday, we had turkey or chicken. And the thing I liked best about that was the dressing. Hans made dressing that nobody has ever duplicated. It was just wonderful. Well, I know that I gained 10 pounds that winter I worked there. Because uh, we were allowed to eat one meal a day when we worked full eight hour shift. And that was such a treat because Coming from a small town, I didn't have the experience of eating in restaurants, let alone working in one. And I started out as a dishwasher, and Louise come to me and she says, Norma, I don't want to hide you in the kitchen anymore. You go out and learn to be a waitress. I said, oh, but I'm scared. Hans will holler at me. No, she says, I'll tell Hans not to holler at you. Well, from that time on, when Hans was going to correct me, he would point his finger. He'd say, you, okay, okay. I'd sneak out front as fast as I could go and do my work, you know. And even in those days, I don't think I heard too good because somebody would poke me and say, hey, you're one in the kitchen. Okay, I'd run back there. And Martha Quirm used to call me Yogi Bear because she said I had such short, fat little feet to run back and forth between there and the customer. Hans was the best chef. He always had the stock pot on the back of the stove for every day he had a different soup. And they were different soups. He'd make pepper pot soup. He'd make the New England clam chowder that was absolutely the best. Every day was a different menu and different specials. And I think when I started there, I think I started out at 25 or 35 cents an hour. And I, too, worked the split shift because I lived downtown. It was easy for me to come in and, and work um, the two hours at noon and then come back at 5 and work till closing. I worked at the Third Street Cafe in 19, 
Um, 48 until sometime in the latter part of 1950. My fondest memories are of working with Shirley when she was just a barely teenager. I loved her mother and father. They were very good to me. And customers like the Gill family, the Cahill family, people that worked at the bank were there every afternoon for coffee. We had to learn to call our orders in. We'd come to the kitchen and there was a certain protocol. If we had fried chicken, we had to say that first. Um, roast beef and that was kind of irrelevant to Hans because he could just dish that up. But food that he had to cook, we had to say two chicken dinners, three roast beef dinners. And then if we forgot and added a veal steak, then he'd point his finger and correct us. I wasn't right. I had to say chicken, veal steak, and then the roast beef. He says, I don't care about the roast beef. You tell me that when you pick it up. And the thing I remember most is everything was in our head. That made us more speedy because we didn't have to stop and write anything down. Well, then years later when the cooks wanted writing everything written down, I couldn't even scratch out an order they could understand. So I'd have to work a week or so before they'd read my writing because we were so used to it. everything was in our head. We picked our order up, it was in the order we called it in, and nothing ever written down. And this is something that um, Hans explained came from France years ago. He says, you have to write it, you'd never be a good waitress. So we would go, I think maybe it was about 10 people at a table we could remember their orders completely from start to finish. And after 10 people, we get another waitress to the other side of the tables because they could remember about that many. Right. Yeah. And it's, it really was fun. It was, it was more fun than work after I got over being afraid of hands. At 11 o'clock, the noon rush would start and it'd be like packed. People waiting in the aisles and you're trying to carry your and we all called in our orders. Nothing was written down and Hans would remember. And there would be like, what, six or eight waitresses at noon? Eight. eight waitresses at noon. I was fresh off the farm and never worked before. Uh, I worked at Rex Cafe for two weeks. And the hostess at Thursday Cafe, Millie, and I don't know her last name. Patterson. Um, I roomed at their house, and she said, well, come to Third Street. They'll hire you. <laughs> so, And I was hired in the kitchen as a dishwasher and worked there until one day Hans told me, you're going to be a waitress. And I said, no, I'm not. And he says, yes, you are. <laughs> and they got me a uniform and stuck me out there. <laughs> Uh, very shy and couldn't talk to people. My husband said it was the best thing that ever happened because you learned how to talk to people. And there was one waiter, very, very good. <laughs> we collided in the aisle one time with about, we each had about 10 coffee cups. So we were soaked with coffee. <laughs> they were all mainly regular customers that were there day in and day out. So they were all acquainted and they would have a chance on their breaks to visit a little bit and relax. Well, you went up to the table and you greeted the people. You served water first. That was your first thing. And then when they ordered their meal, then you had to take their choice of soup or juice and salad. We had to serve the soup or the juice first. And when they're done with the soup, we had to take that away and serve the salad. When they're done with the salad, we removed those plates and brought the entree. And then dessert was always extra in those days for like pie or that. And we were always instructed to offer them pie because that made more money. And profit was the name of it, you know. 
And so by the time you were done, you served many, many courses. And when they received their dessert, you never used a tray. Everything was on your arms. As you were asking their desserts, you were loading your arm with their dirty dishes. Then you'd go by the dishwasher station and you'd kind of tip it. And then they'd all come off and you'd go and pick up orders from the cook. And it was all about coordination. Everyone was wearing uniforms and everybody had to be neat. Everyone had to wear a hairnet. And I guess that was the thing that impressed me the most working there. They were pink and kind of like a, a polyester, not polyester, I don't know, a nylon or nylon. something. Nylon, after the yellow ones, they were, they were nylon. And that what was really neat is you washed them and they were never wrinkled. One thing, we had the white, or the yellow cotton uniforms, so it was, we all took prestige in having the best starched, ironed uniform, and everybody did look really nice. All the food was made fresh. Nothing came in canned or frozen. Mm -hmm. My dad made his own dressing for salads and his own shrimp sauce. He cut his own meat. He cut his own meat. He'd buy the whole cow and cut it up. We got, um, we got fish that came in on ice, but they needed cleaning, and that was one of my horrible jobs, to clean fish. <laughs> and. Um, the chickens came in on ice, but they, they were already gutted out. What else? We had to peel potatoes. We had a potato peeler. That was really a, a big deal to have a potato peeler. And then we, well, we had it. That's huge. Yeah. And then um, in those days, there were no ice machines. We got blocks of ice out of Lake Bemidji and chip out for our Coca-Colas and our water. If somebody wanted ice in their water, that was Lake Bemidji water. <laughs> Yeah, it was pure water. And I, you know, I don't think anybody ever got sick, did they? No. Well, it was always clear. <laughs> Third Street was the place to go. Um, the Markham um, was the bus stop, and they got a lot of the hotel people and stuff like that. Influential people. The gills in particular, I waited on them every evening. I can almost tell you what they had to eat. Mama Gill had um, liver and onions fried in butter. And Papa, I don't remember what he had. Prime rib. Prime, was it prime rib? Yeah, it was usually their favorite. And they always left me a dime. Third Street Cafe was located at 209 Third Street where Wells Fargo is now located. The part of Wells Fargo that has a glass roof and there were about 10 rooms upstairs that were rented out to the waitresses for $5 a week. Well, I think part of it was the elegance of the cafe with the tablecloths and the, the professionalism of what they taught us on how to serve the food and present it way back then. They do a good job in some places nowadays, but it's, it's, not, it's not a polished thing. I remember the kitchen staff. I had lots of fun with Bertha. I always called her, Ma was it, no, Marsha. Martha, and I always called her Marsha. And she spoiled me in the kitchen. She gave me little tidbits. <laughs> um, and I worked a split shift most of the time. Worked over the noon hour, then had a few hours off, came back, and, and I'm not sure just what time I came back, but it was for the supper hour, and then I worked till close at midnight. And it was open that late, were they busy? And I hated basketball season because we got so busy and all these kids ordered malts and tried to get, you know, what was, we had like four things and tried to get all the malts made for everybody it was a nightmare. <laughs> when you walked into the cafe, you had booths that was all along the one wall and the booths were big enough, six people could sit in it comfortably. 
and then they had a section of of uh, booths for two. I can't remember how many, must be five of them that went down the center and then there was two counters. And when I first started waitressing, that's where they put me was on the counter. And the most fun was at lunch when the railroad guys came in. <laughs> How's that? Um, they teased me a lot. I'll never forget the day that I went by and knocked all their hats off. And I was so surprised because they were all bold and they all got mad. <laughs> The pastry cook would come to work about two thirty, three thirty in the morning, and she would put it. She was absolutely the best. She every day would make like thirty pies, six cakes, breakfast rolls, just to die for. They were so good, and we served a steak sandwich. Buck and a quarter. Buck and a quarter, and you get this nice about a six ounce steak with a salad and toast and french fries. When I came home from school in the summertime and Christmas vacation, I would work in the restaurant. And most times I would have to open it at six o'clock in the morning. Breakfast was a difficult shift because we had to cut grapefruit and squeeze fresh orange juice. We used to have big boxes of orange juice and we had to squeeze orange juice every time we had an order. Hans and Louise Marx were absolutely wonderful people. They were so good to me. And they treated everyone like family. And that's what Louise would always tell us, work together as a family. And that brought us all very close. We've all, a bunch of us are lifelong friends. One thing I really remember, my mom was really good to her waitresses. Um, many times they were poor. If there were, a lot of times there was food left over that she would send home. And I think probably every night soup went home with somebody. <laughs> so anyway, they, they were very good people and they, they took care of their employees and they really liked their customers and wanted to serve them. I kind of started out like a lot of younger people do. They might start out with a very traditional idea of what art is, realistic type forms for sculptures, you know, trying to copy what you see. And then as eventually you start to just give your impression of what you see. And, in, and that evolves after a while. Because a lot of people have a hard time relating to abstract art because they don't understand it. Well, if you just break it down to simple terms, how about we start with do you like the colors? I mean, people buy a shirt, they like the color. Do you like the design on it? Well, those are the same things you should appreciate when you look at a, an abstract painting is, are there some things you do like about it? Instead of just saying, I don't understand it because I don't see any horses in it. I don't see a person in it. I don't see a barn in it. Uh, does that qualify as a painting? What's kind of ironic about me being an abstract painter is I buy paintings that are more impressionistic and realistic. So I have a great appreciation for a lot of art. Today I'm going to work on a new series of paintings that I'm working on, but it's basically a drawing painting. So I'll be doing some drawing and then I'll be doing some painting over it. So we'll start that today. With my style of painting, I use a lot of medium. So there's some pigment involved, but there's a lot of medium. I like building up the surface and medium become transparent. Okay, so we'll start out here with a drawing process. And basically what it's called a gesture drawing, which is just a lot of movement in a, uh, with a drawing uh, instrument. So what I'm gonna do is, this is charcoal, and this is blank canvas, so I'm gonna just make some uh, lines and then we'll work with those lines. The, the painting is developed from the beginning. I don't have an idea right now. So as we go through the painting, it develops and evolves, and sometimes I uh, subtract or add on. So we'll start with a little drawing here. Now I've just put some charcoal on there, and now 
Like I was saying, I like to use a lot of medium. And what happens is the medium sets the pigment into the canvas. And you know, you won't have these nice clear lines once I start putting this medium on there. It'll start spreading out. And, and you can see I like to use a lot of energy in my brush stroke. And, you can, and also you can tell I don't really care if I'm dripping all over the place. Because I'll work that into the painting. So it's a development type process. Drawing marks, a lot of high contrast pigment. And uh, the other part of the painting that I like to use is uh, kind of like a Frank Stella where you map off areas with tape and create a nice sharp edge versus a very organic edge. Um, I also like uh, repetitive kind of design. Why this other canvas is drying now, I can show you an, an another technique. I brought uh, one that I've been working on and like I was saying, I use a lot of medium and when it's clear like that, you don't really see the texture. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of stain this bottom area with a little bit darker pigment and see if we can bring out some of that texture. And all I'm going to use is a basic black stain and just about any kind of pigment will work for that. Another little technique I like to use is leave a little, little bit of a line between these areas where the water is running. That leaves a part of the old painting still there. I like the contrast between the, the different colors. So if you let it sit there a while, it'll bleed down. But I like right here where it's, uh, where the water kind of resisted and just ran around this dry area, but because of the amount of water I probably put there, but you got these different bleeding techniques going on there. So now we have a light, medium dark, darker. Now there's some interesting things going on here. Just caused by the texture that's on the surface of the painting, uh, the bleeding and the water, um, how the pigment stuck to some areas and did in others. So we'll, we'll let that dry a little bit and then uh, what I'll do is I'll put some medium over the top of that. Now what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this larger brush I got here and I'm going to kind of dry off the canvas a little bit before I stain it. Now what's going to happen when uh, I stain this canvas, wherever the medium is, that's not where the pigment is going to stick to anymore. It's going to stick to the bare canvas. So you're, you're going to get bright areas and clear areas. So what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to put a, a load up a lot of pigment on top, but I'm going to keep adding water to it and letting that stain the rest of the canvas. There's a couple of things that have happened here. Is the pigment is stained, plus what medium I have is getting reactivated and it's going to cause some drip lines too. But right now I think I'm going to just concentrate on the top half and whatever happens on the bottom is caused by the water. So I'll let it sit for a while and we'll go on to the next step. Let me uh, put this one back up there. That, that's one thing about doing a series of paintings is uh, uh, it does take time for the paint to dry. Now acrylics dry fairly fast, depending on how much uh, uh, liquid you use. While this is drying, I can work on another one, and I can get back to it within a reasonable amount of time. So I'm always energetically trying to work on the surface, uh, not worrying about if the brush strokes are all going the same way. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna uh, show you a technique I use to get a hard line, and that's basically uh, using some uh, tape and then sealing the edges so no paint gets behind it. Part of my style is about threefold. It's the heavy paintbrush style, the repetitive designs that I like to do, like, you know, these drip things are happening here. That's repetitive. And also the, the drawing edge of uh, using charcoal. And also the painted line with the hard edge line. And then the key thing then is using those along with the transparency to create many layers. So I'm going to paint with some pigment to uh, fill this in and we'll let that dry and then I'll pull the tape up so you can see the technique. 
Okay, now I'm gonna pull off uh, the tape that I just uh, painted on, and I want you to see how, when I take this off, you got crisp edges, and it forces this form or line to kind of pop off the canvas. This is kind of fun part of the painting, too, because you get to see what really happens. These are ideas that I came up with over my lifetime. I don't say they're original, but I picked them out from other artists. So there's so many possibilities. I haven't even, in my 35 years, scratched the surface of possibilities. All the artists in the world, there's so many, there's so much good art out there. It is the process of creativity. You're creating something that nobody else is doing right at this moment. It may be similar to or have uh, characteristics of somebody else's artwork, but they didn't do it exactly like you. And that's, I think, is the goal of the artist to feel that he's done that. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any Common Ground segment, visit us at lptv.org backslash common ground. individual segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.